Lord be with you. And also with you. It is so good to be uh, home, to be back with all of you today on this fifth Sunday of Easter. Um, the 14 missionaries that you commissioned, that you sent to go to Guatemala a couple of weeks ago. We uh, returned uh, last Sunday night right about midnight. By the time I got home, it was around, uh, I think, close to 1 o'clock. But thank you for keeping us in your, uh, your prayers. I'm going to talk a little bit about our mission um, during, the, during the sermon today. We're also very blessed to have with us uh, Mr. David McGinnis. He is a Gideon. Uh, Bethlehem has been a supporter of the Gideon ministry for many, many years. There will be a door offering uh, for the Gideon ministry today, and I look forward to hearing him speak uh, in this, this service. Just a wonderful blessing to know that wherever you go, literally anywhere in the world, you can usually find a Gideon Bible. Um, this Wednesday, the district is going to be here, or the president of the Florida Georgia District, as well as some of the district staff. Uh, this is an RSVP event. Uh, if you'd like to participate, I think you can still sign up. There might be a little bit of room left. Um, the Holy Smokers are cooking. There is a light dinner served from 5 to 6, and then the district presentation from 6 to 8. So if you would like to participate, you can call the church uh, reception, and they'll connect you with uh, registration for that. I'm also going to be starting a new membership class a week from this Wednesday. It's going to run for, uh, for two consecutive weeks. I typically do um, have a class that runs three Wednesdays in a row for an hour and a half each, um, but because of uh, just this crazy schedule, um, we don't have those uh, three consecutive Wednesdays available. So I'm going to have two consecutive classes, the 17th and the 24th. They're two hours each. We'll take a 10-minute break in the middle. But I think uh, everything should be pretty much equal. We're only losing about a half an hour, uh, but I'll just try to talk less. So everything will be, uh, everything will be just fine. <laughs> um, we had a baptism at the 930 service, just a beautiful baptism with uh, Madeline Jean Freehopper. I love baptisms because it's a, a miracle happening right in our presence. So uh, it's been a really, really get great day. Those are my announcements. Uh, do you have anything, Pastor Nate? The only thing I have for you today, or if you're watching via live stream, welcome. Good to have you. Yeah. The only thing I have is no youth group this Wednesday or the following Wednesday. Let's try that again with the mic on. All are welcome to the Vicar Bible Study this Thursday at 9.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, everyone is also invited after this service for the, uh, the final day of the Vicar Project. So we had distributed a, a thousand bags uh, throughout the neighborhoods, and today we're going to go pick up the food that people are generously donating to Beam. Um, so if you would like to help, and it would be great if you did, we will meet in the fellowship hall after this service. Excellent. We're here to worship, so please stand, face our processional cross for our opening hymn, The Church is One Foundation.
We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to our time of confession, please kneel as you are able. Though Christ is our cornerstone and has changed our identity to be his chosen people, we often build upon things other than Jesus. Such building crumbles to the ground, for unless we build on Christ, we labor in vain. Still, our Heavenly Father is merciful, and he invites us to draw near to his throne in confidence to ask for forgiveness. We take a moment for silent reflection. Heavenly Father, though we are your chosen people, we have acted in accordance with the world rather than your word. We have proclaimed hatred and violence rather than your excellencies. Forgive us renew us and restore us as your newborn, chosen, priestly people on account of Jesus. Amen. Though Jesus Christ was rejected and killed, God raised him from the dead and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven. We are a newborn, chosen, priestly people. Please stand. Jesus Christ, you are the cornerstone and foundation upon which your church is built. Tear down all that we have built that was apart from you, and tether us upon yourself, our rock and our redeemer. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Today's epistle reading comes from 1 Peter 2, 2 through 10, where Peter writes about Jesus, the living stone, and his holy people. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel procession. According to St. John, the 14th chapter, glory, glory to you, you, O Lord. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Join me as we confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
time, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. David McGinnis, our Gideon representative, to come and share with us just for a few minutes about the ministry of the Gideons. a poem was written by a Swedish pastor, Carl Boberg. It was later put to an old Swedish folk song and translated into several languages by an English missionary serving in Ukraine. World War II broke, II broke out and the song was largely forgotten. Tim Spencer was a member of the Sons of the Pioneers, and those of you who remember Roy Rogers, that was his backup band. Like many traveling musicians, he lived a life... Uh, Kind of a wild life on the road, but his wife lived a life of prayer. And she, one day, he was leaving on tour, and she put a note and a scripture in his suitcase. And when he checked into his hotel room, he opened up the Gideon Bible uh, to look up the scripture, and he just read it and kept reading until that night he gave his life to Christ. He later started the Christian music publishing company Mana Music. His son was attending a youth rally and heard a new song. Well, it wasn't really new. It was that old song that had made it finally across the pond to the United States. The son took a copy home to his father. Tim Spencer secured the rights and published the song, which became the signature song of the Billy Graham Crusades, How Great Thou Art. There are more than 270,000 Gideons and auxiliary in 200 countries, territories, and possessions across the globe and with the support of churches like you, have given out 2.5 billion Bibles and New Testaments around the world in 108 languages. Using the Gideon app on your smartphone, I'm told that you can listen to the Bible in over 1,100 languages and dialects. I haven't listened to that many yet. Uh, the Jacksonville Beaches Camp of the Gideons distributes Testaments to Fletcher, Mayport, Kernan, and Landmark Middle Schools and Fletcher, Sandalwood, and Providence High Schools, as well as the University of North Florida and the Florida State College at Jacksonville. I think we have a brief video. What is the power of a book for some? It's an escape. For others, it's information. For us, it's truth, the foundation of our faith. It changes who we are to the very core. It confirms our identity and reminds us we are loved, that we have worth, that we may be forgiven. That's the power of this book. It's a message that can give someone life. But there are people all across the world who've never held a Bible in their hands. Some who don't even know it exists. But they need to. And with your help, they can. Because if we have nothing else but the Word of God, we have everything. We lack nothing. That's the power of the Bible. It offers eternal life. Join us in bringing the source of truth to the world. So how can you help and support us? Uh, we are extension, an extension of your ministry here, and you already have helped us in some way. We have our cabinet meeting here once a month, and we have our, have, have our annual uh, birthday party for Jesus Christmas event here in early December. Beyond that, and more importantly, we ask for your prayers for the Gideon ministry. Pray that more women, men and women will join us, and uh, we cannot be effective without the prayers of the churches in our area. You may be able to finance, financially support us from time to time, and that could be as simple as sending a Gideon card. I know that there's a Gideon card display over in your fellowship hall. Um, you, or you can go to sendtheword.org, and a card will be sent for you. Many people honor a family member or friend with five, ten, maybe even twenty Bibles as a memorial or in recognition of a special event. Finally, men consider becoming a Gideon and wives consider joining with them in that ministry. I thank you for your time this morning and listening to our report. Uh, we will continue to pray for you and your pastors and ask that you pray for us 
as we place God's word in the traffic lanes of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Would you please pray with me? Father, today we take comfort in the promise of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he is the church's one foundation, and that he has prepared heavenly mansions for those who trust in him as the way, the truth, and the life. Now bless the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts that uh, these words would be pleasing to you and that they would be edifying, strengthening us in our, in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text for today comes from the Holy Gospel that was read just a few minutes ago. It's the Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing again. It's a long uh, version. Uh, most of these uh, words in these 14 verses are spoken by Jesus. And I would just like to read the first four verses. Hear Jesus speaking to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. This is our text. Grace mercy and peace be unto each of you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. First of all, I want to tell uh, our Gideon speaker, uh, David, today that uh, when we traveled in, in Guatemala, uh, a humble hotel but very comfortable and clean, uh, on the stand right as we entered into our rooms was a Gideon Bible. It's a beautiful hotel at the foot of a volcano with the living word of God that is the church's one foundation. Jesus says that he's the foundation of the church. He has risen and he has ascended into heaven and yet this living word still speaks to us through his own inspired word, which is the Holy Scripture. And what a joy it is to travel throughout the world and to always find that word present there as it is in each of our homes. Jesus is giving the disciples hope. He's giving them encouragement because they have been on an emotional roller coaster. I find it very interesting that now a month after Easter, on this fifth Sunday after Easter, when we've heard the resurrection story, when we've heard about Jesus appearing to Mary, where we have heard about Jesus appearing to the disciples in the upper room and to Thomas and then to the, to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, where their hearts burned within them as he revealed himself to them in the scriptures. <laughs> I just find it so interesting that here we are after these incredible weeks of Easter that today we find ourselves back in Holy Week. These words that Jesus is speaking are spoken on Monday, Thursday, on that Holy Thursday. You see, the disciples had, were full of excitement. On, on Palm Sunday, they were gathered with hundreds and thousands, maybe even a million people. Josephus, the, the Jewish first century historian, says that, that there were as many as a million people in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. They were there for, uh, for the celebration of Passover, but they were also there because they wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus because they had heard about his ministry. They wanted to see Jesus because they had heard about the miracles that he had performed. They wanted to see Jesus because they had heard stories about him giving sight to the blind, about giving hearing to the deaf, about raising the, the paralytic, 
and telling him to take up his, his bed and walk. They were there on that first Palm Sunday because they wanted to see this Jesus who had even raised Lazarus from the grave. And so people are on the on top of the buildings and they are on the hillsides and they are even up in the trees hoping to get a glimpse of Jesus. Hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even up to a million people, and I can only imagine what was going through the disciples' minds on that day. They were having a celebration. They were hearing hallelujahs and hosannas. I can even see the disciples giving high fives to each other. Look what is happening here. And I wonder if they even talk again about what each of their positions would be in this kingdom that they thought that Jesus was establishing on earth, even though Jesus had told them over and over again that his kingdom was not of this world. They couldn't get their minds away from seeing their part of power in an earthly kingdom. After all, even the mother of the sons of Je Zebedee, James, and John had asked Jesus if one of her sons could sit on his left and another son sit on his right in his kingdom. Here they are, just four days later on Monday, Thursday, and their hearts are troubled. Their hearts are troubled because they have heard about the plots of the Pharisees to kill Jesus. They've even heard Jesus' own words talking about his death. And they've even heard their Savior, they've even heard Jesus say that one of his own, one of his 12 followers would betray him. And their hearts are troubled. And Jesus gives them comfort. For you who have troubled hearts today, Jesus gives you comfort and he gives you promise and he gives you hope and he gives you his living presence. He says he's gone to prepare a place for you. But he says that he's going to come back because where he is, he wants us to be also with them, with him. And he gives the disciples hope. He gives them hope and he gives you and me hope. Two weeks ago, we were on our way up to Antigua, Guatemala. I think we got a good night's rest. And the next morning, we were up early to go and build homes. We built two homes. We built six stoves. All of this was arranged by Holly Dellinger. She was the leader this year for this incredible trip, and we're grateful to you and all that you did, Holly. Thank you. And God bless this, this ministry. When we went to the site, the sites for the two homes that we were building, the only thing that had been built so far was the foundation that had been laid. The lumber was there, the nails were there, the tools were there. But the only thing there was the foundation, a foundation maybe three or four feet thick, a solid foundation. When you looked at this foundation, you would think that nothing could ever make this foundation fall. And they need a thick foundation because two huge volcanoes, Fuego and Agua, are about 12 miles away, one of them still active, fire and agua. In fact, one of them was shooting smoke into the sky while we were there. And by the end of the week, we had constructed the walls and put on the roof and divided the rooms, two bedrooms, a, a living room, an outdoor kitchen. Don't let your minds wander into an HGTV outdoor kitchen. It was very humble, with a very humble stove that we built, but several of us talked about, you know what? Maybe we need to add to our, uh, to our barbecue pit or to our grills. Maybe we need to build one of these stoves for ourselves as well. Simple and yet incredible and wonderful for the 
the people that live there because finally they have a stove with a stack that takes the smoke outside of the home so that the smoke that they've been breathing in isn't killing them anymore. And at the end of the week, when we did the house blessing and invited the families to come up onto the patio of their newly constructed home, I talked about the solid foundation that was necessary because of all the seismic activity that takes place there. But I told them that the most important foundation of their home was Jesus. That he was a foundation and they were the living stones. That everything else that was material, important for them and for their health and for their safety, protection from the elements. But that the real foundation of their home was Jesus. And the team built a couple, made a couple of crosses and we handed the crosses to the family members as a sign that Jesus lived there, that he was their savior, that he loved them enough to die for them. That all of their sins were forgiven through his death on the cross, that that's how much he loved them, to give himself up for them, that he rose on the third day and that he's alive. And that's why he was a living presence in their home. And we gave them a Bible. David, we gave them a Bible. <laughs> to remind them that the most important voice speaking in that home would be the word of God, would be the words of Jesus, words like we are reading today, so that whatever they faced in their lives, that their hearts would not be troubled. And we gave each of the families keys to their home. It's really amazing because when we handed the keys to their new home, they didn't know how to use them. The mothers of these families did not know how to put the key in the knob to open the door because they had never had a door. They had never had a, a key to open a door before. We showed them how to use the key that opened the door and immediately they went in and they fell to their knees. And they lifted up their hands and they praised God. Because for the first time in their lives, they had a real home. They had a shelter. It was a powerful thing. But I don't think that they were just praising God for this shelter that they had. They were praising God because of the key of the gospel. You know, we talk about the office of the keys. We talk about the key that closes and the key that opens heaven. We talk about the law and we talk about the gospel. The key of the law says that heaven is closed to those who are not repentant and those who don't believe. But the key of the gospel is that Jesus opens the door of heaven for us. And that's what they saw. And that's what they believed. And for that moment, their hearts were not troubled. And with the living presence of Jesus in that home and in their own lives, anything that happens in their future, their hearts will be calm because Jesus is there in their hearts and in their souls and in their homes. You know, there are a lot of houses in this world. You have a house, I have a house. <laughs> There are lots of other houses, too. There's a house of Dior. There's a house of Fabergé. There's a house of Valentino. There's a house of Versace. There's a house of Valentino and, and Ralph Lauren and Gucci. That's what they call all of those houses, the house of. They have this beautiful facade. But inside, I have a feeling that it's very empty. Jesus knew what it takes to make a house a home. And so he tells us today that he went to prepare a place for us. And he's telling that to the disciples so that they can be trouble-free because they are being promised a dwelling place with God. This isn't just a building. This is a place where God dwells with them, where he abides with them. 
in a living presence. This is a promise that Jesus continued to give on that that Monday, Thursday, when they were talking about who was going to be the greatest among them. Jesus says, you want to be the greatest? You need to be the servant of all. And he washed their feet. He instituted the Lord's Supper. He says, I'm going to be present with you forever in the bread and the wine, my very body and blood given and shed for you. I'm going to be there and do this often because my living presence is there so that you are never alone in your home. He gave him a commandment, a new commandment to love one another. As he had loved them, he says, as I have loved you, so love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. And then when the conspiracy was taking place outside of this upper room, Jesus speaks these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you so that where I am, you may be also. That's a beautiful thing so that whatever you're dealing with today, whatever anxieties are there, whatever troubles are there, whatever grief you're, you're facing in your life, Jesus calms you with his spirit, with his living presence, with his living word today. And he's written an address on your hearts. You know where your home is. I don't know all of your hearts, but as I look out at you today, I would say that most of you know where your dwelling place, your eternal home is going to be. In Guatemala, there wasn't a single home there that had a street address written on their homes. We have street addresses written on our homes, but the most important address that you will ever have in your life is something that's written on your hearts and on your souls, and that is St. John Street, 316. That's where we all live. That's where all the saints and all the people of God live. That's where the Guatemalans that we served will someday live with you and me, because Saint, we live on St. John Street, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the promise that Jesus gave to the disciples. It's a promise he gives to you and me. It's the promise that he gave to the Guatemalan people that we served just a couple of weeks ago. And soon he's going to be coming back. He's going to be coming back for all of us so that we may be where he is. It's an incredible thing to have this promise, to know exactly where we are going to spend eternity. And you know what else? I think, I think most of us are all at least partly there. We're almost there. And because we're almost there, don't, don't be discouraged. I'm going to be 70 soon. Most of me is almost there. And as I look around the congregation today, I would say that most of you is almost there as well. Our names are written there. Our citizenship is there. Our inheritance is there. Our God is there. Our Savior is there. My grandparents are there. My dad is there. And for many of you here today, your grandparents are there. Your parents are there. And as I look around, I see that, yes, even some of your children are there. So much of us is already there. And soon it will all be fulfilled. And we will all, we will all be in our Father's house. May it be so for Jesus' sake. Amen.
come to our time of prayer, today our prayer response is here, our prayer. Let us now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, through the power of Christ's resurrection, you adopt all who believe in him. Receive us as your newborn children and nourish our faith through the pure spiritual milk of your word, that we may dwell in your presence forever. Be present with all those laboring to bring your word more fully into the lives of those who need it. So too, be with us, that we may ever desire the nourishment of your holy word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your power brought all things into being and still preserves what you've made. Bless Joseph, our president, the Congress of these United States, Ronald, our governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants. Lead them to honor you and your purpose, establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue, and protecting all life. Give them wisdom in moderation to lead for the well-being of the nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Heavenly Father, for the sake of your dear Son, who has restored all things by his cross, grant healing, comfort, deliverance, and peace to those in need. Bless the sick, the sorrowing, the anxious, the fearful, the homebound, the homeless, the dying, and all who have requested our prayers, including Janet Wigman, Dennis Rickard, Jean Wells, Eleanor Corbett, Erica Williams, Lauren Sifereth, Susan Beatty, and Kevin Owens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these things, O oh Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and
same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may this, the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in body and in soul, now and unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have purified us through this meal, the very body and precious blood of Christ. We pray that you would strengthen us to love one another as you have loved us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.